Hi, welcome to another session of uh, 1714 Bible study where we gather every once a week just to go through the Word of God and uh, be exhorted, rebuked, challenged, encouraged so that we might find uh, meat enough for us to be strong to design the times and the equipping God wants us to be present in. 1714 is derived from John chapter 17 verse 14. Uh, it's written that they are in the world but not of the world. So we equip people to have the wherewithal or the tools that God requires them to have so that they can be in the world without necessarily being consumed by the culture of the world. Um, it is December 2020. Welcome to December 2020. Um, in a few days I turn a year older and it's normally a time for me to reflect quite a bit concerning the journey that I have had with God on many occasions. Um, so I just purpose to take this time to reflect on some of the things the Lord has been speaking to us since the year began uh, it's been a, a year of hibernation for the entire globe in one way or another so i remember in the beginning of the year the lord began exhorting us concerning the ingredient that is needed to mitigate circumstances that have now begun to become so apparent and so devastating in the world and i remember he took us to the book of isaiah chapter 33 verse 6 Isaiah 33 verse 6 and uh, he began to bring out some particular issues or some particular things that we needed to consider even as we confront our seasons and our times in this day and age so I will read Isaiah 33 verse 5 and 6 it goes something like this he says the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high he is exalted, for he dwells on high. He says he has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. So he has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And then verse 6 says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times, and strength of salvation. And he says the fear of the Lord is his treasure. So wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. So we spoke about the stability of the times because normally what happens when history begins to go contrary to the wisdom or the machination of God, what is introduced in history is darkness. And every time people see darkness, they are compelled most of the times to withdraw. And many times people feel like um, they are lost, they don't have the navigation, the navigational tools of destiny. They begin to question a lot of things concerning the, uh, the consistency and the assurance of God. So the Lord began to speak to us at the beginning of this year concerning the stability of the times, which means there's an ingredient that is necessary for times to be stable. And this ingredient is incumbent upon the exaltation of the Lord. So I just I just didn't want to come to a point where I'm saying, oh, wisdom, the stability of the times. I wanted us to begin to understand, first of all, there's the position that God takes that guarantees that in that position, one of the extracts of his expression will be wisdom. And then that facilitates the stability of our times. So I want to Go back to where we began the, the, the start of the year concerning the stability of the times and wisdom. And uh, I want you to understand that when God is speaking to us, he's not speaking distant from us, especially those who he has called by his name. He is not speaking distant from us. He's speaking as one who is father to us. And then he's speaking, expecting that the actions of his speech will be expressed through us. So the word of God is first. His then is expressed 
in us. The visibility of the word of God is incumbent upon our action, our response to that word. The visibility of the word of God is incumbent upon our hearing the word of God and the expression of that word of God. Which means when God speaks, even sometimes concerning himself, and he wants the earth to experience him, he's expecting our obedience to hear him, to make that visibility through action. So when he says the Lord is exalted, he is not distanced from you because your scripture has said that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Your scripture has said we are hid in Christ in God. You see that? We are hid with Christ in God. So the exaltation of the Lord, that posture of exaltation is not distance from you. It's actually an invitational clause for you to begin to see the way he sees so that you may begin to hear what he sees and therefore you may begin to speak or express that visibility of the word. The word became flesh, John chapter 1. So when he says the Lord is exalted, we need to begin to sort of like break down exactly what he means because we can't express what we don't understand. I am one of those guys who likes what we call uh, biblical exegesis whereby you do word studies because a word study combined with another word study can begin to produce a particular potent truth which uh, is important. So that says the Lord is exalted which means he's in a lofty high place and the word the Lord there is the word Jehovah, the self-existent God. He says he dwells on high, which means he lodges or he is residing at a lofty place, a high place. Now, biblical speaking, when you say high place, it's an altitude of elevated dignity. It's not just sitting. The Lord is not just laughing, sitting on a throne. I mean, he's not just posturing. There's a reason why he's that at that particular place. It's a plenary view, it's a plenary perspective. It's the qualitative expression of a God who is above all. So when he invites us to sit with him or to sit with Christ in him, then he's inviting us to that altitude of dignity, that elevated posture of divinity, where we see what he sees, hear what he says, therefore we can begin to express what we have heard. So he says he's lodging there, that, that place called the altitude of elevated dignity. Altitude of elevated dignity. So he says, he is a lofty God. He lodges in a place. And this place is not just a physical, it's not just the, it's the, the importance of this place is not just its physicality. The importance of this place is the perspective. When he sits, when he sits, perspective is an expression of his sitting. When you are talking to somebody and you're conversing and you give somebody your perspective, that perspective is actually an expression of where you are sitting at as far as your thinking is concerned. So when the, says, when the Bible says the Lord is seated in a lofty place, we should go beyond the physicality of the sitting to the thinking perspective. So perspective and position that is elevated. So when you are communing with somebody, when you're communing with the Lord, he invites you to a place of a perspective that is elevated. So you begin to see what he sees, think what he thinks, and in that obedience of that word, you begin to act out that perspective. So he says he is lodging there. He's lodging from a perspective that is above all. And therefore we, as I have said, when we hear this word, we're not just respondents, we're not just passive respondents of this word. We are active respondents of this word. We are also collaborating from that perspective because he's expecting us to become the incarnation of his thinking on the earth, even in these dark and gloomy days. That is the position. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. So when you read that scripture, it's more than just that one English sentence. Is I have been invited to be in a place of elevation so that I may have the same perspective and thinking the Lord has in these dark days. So he says, uh, look at the next scripture, says, he has filled Zion. He has filled Zion. If you go to Hebrews 13, you shall see two meeting places. You are either at Sinai or you are either in Zion. You are either Esau or you are either Isaac. So you can see that. So he says, he has 
filled Zion. What is Zion? Zion is a church. Zion is a church. You, are, you need to understand the principle of the expression of the, test, the New Testament. Collectively, we are a bride. Collectively, we are the bride of Christ. So, we, which is called the church. Collectively, we are the bride of Christ, which is called the church. Singularly, we are the sons of God. Singularly, you are, you are the son of God. So as a son, when sons of God come together collectively, they become the bride of Christ. So you might be in a space somewhere where God has planted you as a son. Or the Lord can come in a setting, either they say a nation or a region, and reside or express himself through his sons collectively, which we call the church. So he says he has filled Zion. This Zion is a capital city. What is a capital city? A capital city is the central hub of a nation where there is a portal of exchange, either of ideas, people, businesses, a trading of sorts. So when the Lord comes and fills the Zion and fills the church, he is expecting the portal called the church to become the trading center where he does what? He transacts his business that are lofty through the church into through the church into the city, through the church into the nation, through the church into the continent, through the church into the globe. So that word city or capital, Zion, is also mean, means the word conspicuous. They are conspicuous people. He has filled Zion and Zion has become conspicuous. He has filled Zion, another word for it, and Zion has become an unshakable pillar. So the Lord is expecting from his perspective Zion the church, sons of God, to be conspicuous, exceptional, elevated pillars that are unshaken. He is expecting us to be that kind, that kind. So he said he has filled Zion. What has he filled Zion with? What makes you conspicuous? What makes you enter into spaces with the dignity of an elevated thing? I'm not talking about haughtiness. I'm not talking about elitism. I'm talking about perspective perspective he says he has filled Zion with what he has filled Zion with two things he has filled Zion with judgment and he has filled Zion with righteousness judgment and righteousness two things when you look at the entire principle of the Old Testament that go hand in hand he fills Zion with the judgment the mishpat and he fills Zion with righteousness the tzadak or zadok if you want to so those two things go together. So let us, exp let us examine the first thing. So as church or as sons, and I'm talking to you as a person in your station. I'm talking to you as a church in your station. This is the way the Lord is expecting us to be thinking. We are carriers of judgment. We are carriers of righteousness. What is judgment? Judgment is not shooting curses at anybody who looks uh, to be in opposition to you. No, no, no. Judgment is above that. Judgment is somebody who can place verdicts. Somebody who is in a position of magistracy. Somebody who can uh, meet out sentences. Not curses, sentences. It is a place of legislation. Just like when you are, it's not, just like when you are in parliament. When you go to parliament, you find bills being passed legislations being formulated so the gathering of the church is a gathering of legislators divine legislators from that elevated perspective of god divine legislators these people have the shapat or shafat they have the what what you call the governing instruments they have the governing instruments they litigate if something is wrong on the earth we come together as a church and conference with our lord and then we litigate we pass a sentence we pass a policy we pass an enactment we render or we introduce a constitution because this earth was designed to be run by the sons of god who are who have the constitution that comes from the heart of god so we have the mishpat shapat is actually governing which means which comes if you look at remember one of his characters called jehoshaphat shapat is that governing principle so the church or this zion is filled 
with the governing principles or the governing instruments of the Lord. So if we don't like what we are seeing on the earth, we gather together and download the mind of Christ and legislate in those areas creatively and therefore things are made straight or the mind of God is represented accurately in those spaces. Uh, so we are that kind of crop of a people. If you don't like the darkness you're seeing, then you come together. You don't come together in panic. You come together as governors. You come together as legislators so that we might be able to formulate policies, divine policies, and then act it, enact them through our businesses, through our families, through our institutions, so that the heavens that the Lord created might be reflected on the earth. So Zion is filled with judgment, and then Zion is filled with righteousness. In fact, the core principle called righteousness is where judgments are drawn out of. The Lord is first righteous. His people are first righteous. And the expression of righteousness is the judgment. So get it right. You are first righteous. How did you become righteous? If you look at the case in point, the example of Abraham. Abraham believed God and God credited in his account righteousness. So we also have believed in Christ and Christ has meted to us his righteousness. So because we are righteous, out of that righteousness we judge. Because we are righteous, out of that righteousness we judge. The word there is sadak, it means the rightness, it means justice, it means prosperity, it means forensic rightness. Where we meet out the mind of Christ, where we meet out the principles of God, right things, things that are, have uh, the expression of a plumb line, straight things, not crooked things. We straighten out things, straighten out, straightening out, straightening out things in our family, straightening out things in our businesses, straightening out things in our society, is meeting out the righteousness of God. So the church is a carrier of those two things, righteousness and judgment. And that's the reason why the Lord is not expecting the church to be uh, downtrodden in these days. He's not expecting it to be overwhelmed in these days. He's expecting it to be at a place where it's elevated and has a perspective. So Zion, full of judgment, Zion, full of what? Righteousness. Now, how does this get displayed to a level where it is consumable? How is it displayed to a level where it is consumable? And that's when now we come to verse 6 where it says, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times. The interfacing of the church and the world, the interfacing of the church and society requires wisdom and knowledge. The interfacing of the church and Jesus or the church and the Father and the church and the heavens requires judgments and righteousness. And out of judgments and righteousness, therefore we see what wisdom and knowledge. Many people mistake these things. Many people you find they are meeting out judgments and righteousness without interfacing it with wisdom and knowledge. So the Lord is saying you come to points where because you're full of righteousness and judgments, as your judgments come out, they come out through the vehicle of wisdom and they come out through the vehicle of knowledge. They come out through the vehicles of wisdom and they come out through the vehicles of what? Of knowledge. Um, Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was full of judgments. When he came before Pharaoh, when he spoke out the interpretation of the dream that Pharaoh had had, had that interpretation that spoken out of a man who was full of righteousness and judgment produced wisdom and knowledge. That interpretation of the dream of Pharaoh that came out of a man full of righteousness and judgments produced what? Wisdom and knowledge. That is how it works out. That is how it works out. So the church seemingly sometimes looks lost because it is full of righteousness and judgment. And then it forgets this other second part, wisdom and knowledge. And the Lord wants us to understand that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of the times. So communities 
companies, families, uh, areas, where, geographical areas where we're in, are still in darkness, are still in chaos, are still unstable because the church has been unable to articulate the judgments and the righteousness of God from an interface of wisdom and knowledge. We need to begin to come to points where we ask the Spirit of God to train us, to tutor us, to become expressive, uh, manifest manifestors of wisdom and knowledge. The world or the earth is relating to, relatable to or relates to easily the wisdom and the knowledge we carry. So when it comes to the church and the sons of God, social engineering, history or civilization, social engineering culture, it requires that social engineering to come from a place of righteousness and judgment. I know I'm repeating myself. And the expression of that righteousness and judgment in that social engineering so that it can be consumable to the common person on the ground requires an interface of wisdom and knowledge. So that word wisdom is actually means skillful wisdom or it means a wise mind or it means a word in action. Another meaning for the word knowledge means cunning, awareness, witty. Cunning, awareness, witty, intelligence, intelligence. So the church is actually a body or an organism, if you could say so. But the Lord has decided to express his, himself through it from the foundation of judgment and righteousness, but producing intelligentsia, producing wit, producing wisdom, producing uh, observation, producing research. You can see that all these words actually are words that encase uh, wisdom and right and knowledge. It says, wisdom builds the house, understanding establishes it, and knowledge fills the house. You've heard of that proverb. But skillfulness, skillfulness, witty, you know, insight, that is when you say witty, insight, inventions, you know, inventions, insight, inventions, um, cunningness, which means being heaven smart on the earth, awareness, which means you're not ignorant, uh, observation, which means research, recognition, which means being able to discover or discoveries, all these words I am mentioning are the expression of judgments and what? And righteousness. So when we say, when God asks us to judge a situation, he's not asking us to cast a situation. He's asking us to come out and bring out wisdom, to bring out knowledge, to resolve the things that are on the ground. Most of us, we, delight, we, are, we become like Peter, uh, John, and James, where who told the Lord at one point, there's a man who's doing what we're doing, shall we now call a fire from heaven to consume him? You know, so the Lord is not asking us to be those who call fire from heaven to consume people. He's asking us in that state of righteousness, in that state of judgment, to meet out wisdom and to meet out knowledge. All those things I have mentioned, skillfulness, uh, witty, wittiness, insight, intelligence, uh, observation, research, innovation. All those things are actually supposed to be the preserve of the church. Society is a sick Society is as sick as an ignorant church. Society is as sick as a church that does not know how to meet out righteousness and judgments through wisdom and knowledge. So unstable times point to a church that does not know how to interface judgments and righteousness through wisdom and knowledge. So we need to begin to understand that. So he says, shall be the stability of the times. What does it mean to be stable? To be stable, it means to be firm. It means to be secure. It means to have faith. You know, when you look at our city, when you look at our nations, people are losing hope. People are losing faith. It says to be stable means to be firm. It means to be resolute. It means to secure it, to be secure. Somebody, it means to, it means to have fidelity. Fidelity means faithfulness to support. It actually means the expression of the right hand. The expression of the right hand. The expression of the right hand. Can you see that? When, when, when the Bible used to say, when somebody who needed to be blessed, they would place the right hand on somebody. They would press, they would place the right hand on somebody. That, that expressed firmness. It expressed security. It expressed fidelity. Is the word emuna or amen 
The just shall live by faith. Faith, imuna, expressing your support. The right hand. So how does the right hand of God get expressed in society? By wisdom and knowledge. By wisdom and knowledge. If you say you are blessed by the right hand of God, are you exuding with wisdom and knowledge? Are you exuding with wisdom and knowledge? That is what brings stability. That's what stability. Stability. It says, shall be the stability of the times. Shall bring strength. Shall bring prosperity. We need to understand that. So, whereas the church is waiting and banking on God to show up, God is waiting and banking on the church to express what it has heard, to express judgments, to express righteousness, and to interface that judgment and righteousness through what? Wisdom and knowledge so stability of the time so as we come to the end of the year we should begin to ask the spirit of god to take us into a tutelage where we learn how to translate righteousness to translate judgments into wisdom and knowledge so that the times we are in can be stable so the times that we are in can be stable but the question to ask then is what times are we in what times are we in Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah 60, was 1 to 3. We saw that in the beginning of the year. I am just reminding you so that you can remember. Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 3. And these are some of the things I told you when we started, I've been contemplating on because every time before I get a year older, in the next few days, I always love contemplating and just doing an audit of the year and asking God, so where are we heading to, where are we projecting? So it begins, you know Isaiah 60, it's a very common scripture. It says, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. He says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. And then he says, And gross darkness the people. Look at that. So most people take verse 2, A and B, and just run with that. <laughs> but Chapter 60 is very clear. It began by talking about arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. He says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you. But the Lord shall arise upon you. Are you seeing that? He says, And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising and kings to the brightness of your rising. So you can see that. That is Isaiah chapter 60. So what times are we in? We are times in which the Bible defines the times of darkness. It says darkness. But that's not the point. It says darkness. The time of darkness. The word darkness there is the word dark, destruction, misery, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. Those are the times we are living in. Those are the times we are living in. Dark, destruction, misery, death, Ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. We have seen all this being expressed this year. These are the things that withhold the light or they're trying to, attempting to withhold the light. Yeah? They're attempting to withhold the light. It says, shall cover. The word cover means fill up or to cloth or to blanket. You know, to cloth. Another word there is a shall fatten. It means to fatten, to cover. You see, so... It, when you are feeding from the vein of darkness, you're being clothed, you're being filled up with dark, destruction, misery, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. So he says, darkness shall cover the earth, number one. And he says, gross darkness, the people. So there are two assaults here, the, the, the assault of the geography, and then the, the assault of the individuals. Darkness covering the earth, and gross darkness, the people. So the one, the gross darkness, is the word gloom, gloom, gloom. It means the lowering of the sky to droop over. And the Lord says this. If you look at that word gloom, because now I'm just I'm speaking more to just the area. I'm speaking more to individuals. You who is sitting at home and listening to me, the design of the enemy is to engineer something I'm calling a mood of gloom, a mood of gloom. So he says, gross darkness, the people. The people, communities, nations that gather together, individuals. So he's trying to engineer in us to take darkness as a feeding point so that we can entertain destruction, misery, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. 
and then begin to ooze out with a mood of gloom. That is the desire of the enemy. But Isaiah 60 began by saying, Arise, shine. There's a solution already planted in the expected darkness. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. So the people who are rising and shining are different or have been cut off from the darkness that is looming. The people who the Bible says, um, and their glory shall be seen upon you, and the Gentiles shall come to your light. You can see all this is in reference to the Gentilic or the Gentile world. So if you think like a Gentile, you begin to entertain these consequences. But if you think as one who is seated with the Lord from a lofty place, you are the one who is meeting judgments that are interfaced with wisdom and knowledge. You speak to your business and say, my business, my family, my community, this area, this country, this city will not be affected by darkness, will not have or have a mood of gloom because the righteousness and the judgments of God are embodied in the church or in the saints or in the sons of God. Therefore, we speak or interface, produce things that bring out what? Wisdom and knowledge. God is expecting us to be that kind of breed of people on the earth. So that we can meet out you know even as people are doing their audit and closing over the years he's expecting us to be those people who begin to be the light the light in the world the light in the world so i hope i am communicating and saying something to you here there's something i'm calling the potentate of darkness let me see if i can get it um luke chapter 22 luke chapter 22 verse 53 Luke 22 we talked about this in the beginning of the year the potentate of darkness Luke 22 verse 53 it says uh, yeah, let me begin from verse 52 then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the, of, of the temple and the elders which were come to him he says be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves they had come to pick him up and then verse 53 says, When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. He says, This is your hour and the power of darkness. He says, I was with you in the temple. I reasoned with you. I argued with you. Nobody came to me against me like a thief. You know? He didn't come with staves and swords to me to gather me as a sword, as a thief, like a thief. And he says, but this is your hour. He says, this is your hour. And then he defines that hour. The, he says, this hour is the hour of the power of darkness, or the authority of darkness, or the potentate of darkness. Isaiah, Luke chapter 22, verse 53. He said, this is your hour for the people. This is your season. This is your instant. He says, of the what? Of the authority, or the influence, or the ability to produce darkness. The ability to produce darkness so there is a rising force that is clothed in darkness and the gloom that is producing the mood of the people or the mood of society right now and Christ is telling is defining to us that within our communities there are this kind of authoritative influences if you could say so potentates authorities if you could say so legislations you know products you know settings that are being governed by the potentate of darkness and he he is saying even as it happens even as it happens uh, he is confident of the fact that he has his church fully secured because his church is in the same or in the midst of this but from a perspective that is elevated from that lofty place from that lofty place from that place where god says he has a perspective you know i uh, Again, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. You know Ephesians 6, 12. I think is an interesting one also there. Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians. Where is Ephesians? Okay, here it is. Ephesians 6, 12, you know it. It says, um, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, says, but against principalities. It says, Against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there are different kinds of things we are wrestling against. Principalities, who are the agenda setters. Powers, who legislate the agenda. And then rulers of darkness, who institute 
in manageable chunks the agenda that has been legislated and then spiritual wickedness in high places those are the minions that preoccupy us with the destruction that makes us not be able to see the scale of war those are the three four four one day we shall go through it today is a different day so it says rulers of darkness of this world is what i'm ex i'm 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 i'm, 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 I'm uh, interested in rulers of darkness of this world the word world there is the word age so every age has an heightened agenda of darkness every age has a heightened agenda of darkness 2020 you have seen a heightened agenda of darkness with respect to uh, COVID-19 amongst many other things amongst many other things but the most glaring one that has actually mobilized the entire globe is COVID-19 so every age an age is, an, is a time span. It's the rulers of darkness of this age. So those rulers of darkness, those potentates of darkness, have the mandate to heighten a particular point of darkness to become the agenda that sets the mood of gloom in any particular setting. So he says, the rulers, so the world ruler, so they, they seize, they seize in, or they lay siege, if you could say so, or captives of the minds and the hearts of men because when the enemy is attacking the darkness he copies God he attacks hearts and minds when God is infiltrating the word in us he puts it in our minds and our hearts so the enemy copies the same same thing the principle of displacement the sower sowed the word and then he sees the first ground when the word was sown what happens so the birds the fowls of the air came and swept and take, took off the, with the seed how do they do it? They don't just take off the seed and leave a vacuum. The enemy steals by instilling or investing misinformation, which is called the lie. So the, the rulers of the darkness, the rulers of this word, rulers of darkness of this world, the word darkness there is the word scotos. It also means the shadow that produces error. The shadow that produces error. So darkness is designed by the principle of darkness who is satan himself diablos the diabolic one john 8 4, 4. in him there is no truth in him there is only what a lie he can package it that it may begin to look like a truth he operates in shifts of ages shifts of ages so he has seasons where he introduces and heightens what you can call what heightens a principle that produces the cloud of darkness or the cloud of gloom darkness of an area darkness of a continent darkness of a company darkness of a family and then he injects in there the mood of gloom so that you're always sustained with that veiled thinking you're sustained with that veiled thinking so uh, <laughs> the lord is actually allow asking us to style up to pick up ourselves and begin to shine and begin to shine let me show you something else let me see if i can go back one chapter so Ephesians 6 uh, one day we shall go through Ephesians 6 and see how it works out but uh, um, look at this verse chapter 5 verse 11 says and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness he's asking us not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them he says for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret look at that he says, let's not have fellowship. It says, not sharing company with, not communicating. Let us not become distributors. Let us not become the holding houses, the clearing houses of darkness. Don't become the clearing house of darkness. He says, don't fellowship with, don't fellowship with. Uh, if you look at chapter 5, you'll see how the Lord is beginning to submit that to us. If you look at chapter 5, verse number 15 of Ephesians, he from chapter 14, 14 chapter 5 verse 14 says wherefore he said awake you that sleepest how do I know if I'm in actually the duvet of darkness is because you're sleeping when you're sleeping you're covered with darkness he says darkness covers them blankets them he says awake thou that sleepest there are many people who are sleepwalking they are vivacious in terms of physically you can talk to them whatever but the thinking the thinking they are sleep walking they're sleepwalking they've been covered by darkness the lord is saying awake you that sleepest and arise from the dead arise from the dead you see sleep darkness sleep darkness sleep death darkness sleep death the expression they are death producers 
death produces it's deathly dark destruction misery death ignorance sorrow wickedness that is how the world is he says you have to learn how to filter you have to learn how to vein yourself into the plug plug yourself into the vein of life not the not the vein of death so he says wherefore he said awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead and christ shall give you light arise shine for your light has come and christ shall give you light so in the new testament jesus christ has risen upon us and we are the light verse 15 see then see 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 then see then that thou walk circumspectly walk is more than just physical walking it also means express yourself thinking it says circumspectly not as fools the word fools there and wise wisdom shall be the stability of the times don't walk as fools so he says see then when the light of christ comes your eyes are opened he says walk he circumspectly circumspect circumference and spectacles circumference and spectacles 360 degrees view of a place walk he circumspectly as wise wisdom will give you that 360 degrees view a design a designing vein a designing job the Lord is introducing into somebody I'm speaking to you now and some things are beginning to become more visible because I'm agitating you to arise some of us have been feeding from the vein of death and we've been been recovered into the duvet of darkness where we can't see beyond the hope that Christ has in us look at that he says well, he circumspectly as wise not as fool he says redeeming the time are you seeing that when you wisdom is a tool of redemption what does it redeem it redeems time it rewards you with time people who have been saying uh, I have lost time on this I don't think my time is there yet or oh, living in the vein or the background of regret and resignation because you feel a season has overtaken you the Lord is restoring wisdom the Lord is restoring knowledge the Lord is coming to a place where he's giving you the eyes to walk circumspectly as wise he says uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil the word evil there is kakos which means uh, when the enemy uses your strength to waste your time I am prophesying and decreeing a restoration of time a restoration of wisdom a restoration of knowledge so somebody might be awakened to see that which was lost being restored in the name of Jesus so you say awake awake walk his circumspectly as wise and believing that God Jesus Christ will become wisdom unto you so you may so your eyes will be able to be opened so that you can be able to walk circumspectly as a wise person as a wise person Lord fill them with wisdom fill them with the light of Christ that they may be able to see that they may be able to see so one of the things I want us to do as we conclude slowly by slowly to understand that wisdom shall be the stability of the times Colossians 1 13 you begin to recognize the fact that you have been redeemed you have been delivered from darkness you have been delivered from darkness darkness is no longer yours Colossians 1 13 says who has delivered us from the power of darkness who has delivered us from the power of darkness he has rescued you through the flow of his blood through the flowing of his blood and then where into the kingdom or into the grip into the kingdom or into the grip of his dear son he has invited us into a love feast of charity and benevolence he has invited us into a love feast of charity and benevolence so the Lord has broke you out of the deliverance of darkness and right now this is happening as I speak I can sense it's happening some things are being shattered it's happening in different levels to different people in different settings things are being shattered eyes are being opened you'll begin to receive revelation and just glimpses of things that were now beginning to slip from your grip Jesus is breaking chains and I'm, I'm not even talking about chains of guys getting born again I'm talking about people who have been trapped who are Christians because you've been feeding from the vein of misinformation the vein of the lie so I'm praying that the Lord begins to open your eyes you begin to see the folding of the year and the opening of the other one with more boldness with more confidence with more trustworthiness he says it delivered me from the power of darkness or rescued you 
through the flow of his blood into the kingdom or into the grip of his dear son. The Lord has gripped you. He has pulled you to himself into the love feast of his charity and benevolence. First Peter 2 9. First Peter 2 9. These are your scriptures. <laughs> These are our promises. Uh, so when darkness begins to come and terrorize, you just tell them, the Lord already has a grip on me. The Lord already has a grip on me. First Peter 2 9. First Peter 2 9. It says, uh, let me see. We know it. It says, <laughs> Um, but ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Yeah, you know that? First Peter 2 9. Ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He says, A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness. Out of darkness. Into what? Into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but ye are now a people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I prophesy mercy to you in the name of Jesus. He says, yes, he has, he, has, he has pulled you into. It begins from verse 7. Let's go to verse 7. We see a bit. He says, and to you therefore which believe, and to you which believe, he says, his precious, his precious, he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And then he says, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they are appointed. So he says, don't stumble at the word. He says, if you stumble at the word, you enter into darkness. Verse 7, and you therefore which believe, he is precious. So if you believe, he is precious. But you who is disobedient, you do not see the stone which the builder has disallowed. The same is made what? The head of the corner. The things you're ignoring that God entrusted you with, that becomes the cornerstone of the foundation of the life that he wants you to have. Are you understanding? He says, and then the same has been made the chief of the corner. So that's some of the things God has been throwing at you from uh, February to now, those things are solid cornerstones with which you can build the destiny of your life upon. He says, if you believe, if you believe, don't stumble at the word. Don't stumble at that word. Because that word, when it comes into your life, it will make certain demands. And if you don't take care, if you misread that word, you shall be offended. And if you're, if you're offended, you'll stumble on that word. There is no word that the Lord has brought to you that does not have the wherewithal to help you adjust, muscle you up, to build upon uh, the destiny that God desires for you for 2020 or 2021, therefore. So... You are a precious, you are chosen generation. You know, we love verse 9, we are chosen generation. But most of us are shouting, we are chosen generation. But we ignore the previous scripture, verse 8. Most of us are stumbling upon the promises which he's bringing to us. Because his promises are the ones that are producing the light that we need to shine. So don't stumble upon the promises that he's bringing against towards you. We are people. We say you're marvelous people, a wonderful this is an ex a sample of admiration. We cannot be conflicted as marvelous people. Are you understanding? This is not a judgment to you. This is an invitation for you to light up. This is an invitation for you to shine. This is an invitation for you to bring out the, uh, the wisdom, to bring out the light, to bring out the knowledge that the Lord has placed in you. He wants us to overcome the darkness of gloom, this gross darkness. He wants us to come out and ascend, to come up and begin to confront particular things that are being floated in the air. There's a sound of confusion, but God wants you to counter it with a word of certainty. Sound of confusion, con con counter it with what? With a word of certainty. You are the one who he has called to carry the birthright of sonship, to contest particular things to contest particular things. The potentate of darkness seeks, it has come, that potentate of darkness has come to grab and capture collective imagination. It has come to paint a picture of a global bully. It paints a picture in our minds. It has come to create what you call historical imprints so that we can be able to begin to give our children narratives of disaster and darkness. It has come to exact a portal of dominance 
to produce what you call global trauma. But the Lord is saying, those that have the birthright, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, those that have the birthright. Hebrews chapter 12, verse, eight, uh, verse, uh, verse 16. Those that have the birthright, those who, are, those who are the sons of God, we need to contest this collectively as a church and singularly as sons of God. We need to confront this, this blacking out of the collective imagination of a people. We need to confront this global bully painting a picture. We need to begin to paint pictures of hope, prophesy pictures of light, to prophesy the emancipation of the people who have been gripped by the force of darkness. We need to begin to cut off and start telling stories to create historical, historical imprints of the glorious works of God. And we need to also become the overwhelming portal of his glory on the earth instead of the exerting the portal of dominance of darkness. We need to become the overwhelming portal of the glory of God. We need to be that. We need to be, that. We need to be those kind of people. So, sons of God, you've been placed here to be scriptors of the proper powerful narrative of God. Remember the two things. As I stop, I can go on and on and on, and on but today I just feel I should give attention. Remember the two things. You are the carriers of righteousness. You are the carriers of what? Uh, judgments. The carriers of righteousness and judgment because you are coming and operating on the earth from a, that place of the lifted God, that place of the perspective that is high, that place of revelation, that place of elevation, thinking like he thinks to produce. But you interface these judgments, you interface this righteousness with wisdom and knowledge. You interface this righteousness and judgment through wisdom and knowledge. Everybody out there is waiting for you to come out of your own quagmire of darkness because the Lord has already delivered you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, to the grip, to the love, feast, benevolence and charity. So that you can become that person, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And as much as gross darkness shall cover the earth, uh, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, you, the Bible says, Gentiles shall come to the light of your shining. I'm beginning to prophesy the conspicuous expression of the sons of God. God is going to set you up as a light in spaces where there is crazy darkness, but because you are using the lumens of God. You know what, you know what lumens are? When a light shines, lumens. You are using the lumens of the glory of God. You will disparage that darkness from the minds of men, from the hearts of men. You will produce innovations. You will produce uh, products. You will produce ideas, insight, foresights. You will contrive things that come from the heart of God and that will shine in your sector, shine in your family, shine in your destiny, in your destiny and shine in your generations. That is what the Lord wants the church of God to look like. We are here to legislate. And there is no force big enough, whether they be governments, whether they be institutions that can overrule the sons of God. The sons of God are people born out of the Spirit of God. Jesus has left us here to become representative kind. As we gather the church, we are gathering in our own parliament to legislate, mitigate, create policies that turn around the, the, the deficiencies we are seeing in our sectors. So arise, shine, and light, and arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Wisdom shall be the stability of your time. This time requires the interfacing of that wisdom and knowledge. So this is David Paul Mavia. Uh, next time again, uh, the 1714 Company Bible Study. I just thought I should share with us some of those things so that we may be able to cut to begin to do recaps of what the Lord began to show us when the year began. It is not too late. Don't start putting, crafting your calendar around 2020 to 2021, wondering some things are not happening now so they won't happen. No, no, no. The Lord does not work like that. The clockwork of God operates from the point of His working in you. That's how the clockwork of God works. God has a clockwork. That clockwork is tied to His will. His will is in you. So that is how God operates. So, but as the year ends, let it end with power. Let it end with wisdom. Let it end with knowledge. Um, so this is 1714 Company Bible Study. We gather every week to share such things. 
I have been adjuring you by the masses of God. Tell somebody concerning this if you believe it is going to help them or to bring them to a closer relationship with God. Uh, pray with us even as we close <coughs> towards the end of the year. Uh, if you have anything you need to be prayed for, does, let us know. Send me an email, the1714, uh, uh, the 1714 company at Gmail. Uh, so we may pray with you. We may be able to just stand with you concerning the things you're going through. If you want more material, again, you can go there, the 1714 company at gmail.com. Send us an email so we may be able to communicate and just be with you concerning these things. You can also pray with us concerning the things we're trying to we believe in God for many things. We believe in God for technology to be able to record like this. We believe in God for resources to be able to publish material. Uh, I told you last time we have a book I've just done, Love Driven Thinking, one of the teachings we had this year, and the law of contradiction. So a soft copies will be rolled out in a short time for your purchase. But uh, for one of these, especially Love Driven Thinking, I'm going to do also uh, five five lessons of a class online so that you can sign up and do it and you'll be blessed so thank you so much god bless you dp mavia here see you next time as we begin to do an audit of the year that has been the lord be with you amen <laughs>